So welcome everyone. This is a roundtable discussion. And uh, today, Finnis will be, uh, Finnis Reed will be talking about custom small area estimates. And uh, Finnis Reed is a research specialist with the um, Demographic Research Unit uh, with the California Department of Finance. And they will be sharing their knowledge about methods for small area estimates. And Finnis got their start in population modeling, working with salamanders, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, way to start working on this. And uh, Finnis now applies their GIS and data analytics expertise to human populations. So I'll hand it over to Finnis and uh, I look forward to learning something new today. Awesome, thank you so much, Gigi. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming to the round table today. Uh, as Gigi mentioned, my name is Fennis Reed. I'm with the Demographic Research Unit. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about a program that's near and dear to my heart which is small area estimates for the state of California. We're gonna talk a little bit about where we're at today and where we're planning to go in the future. Uh, just a little bit of a disclaimer, the runtime for the presentation portion of today is about 35, 35 minutes. Um, and we'll have about 25 minutes then after that for discussion. Uh, as you guys come up with questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat box just so you can keep track and kind of remember. And we will be sure to address everything we can as we go along. So the goal that I want you all to keep in mind uh, before I begin this real presentation here um, is that what we're hoping to accomplish is to demonstrate the current methods we are applying for small area estimates throughout the state. And I also want you all to keep in the back of your mind um, some important key critical questions, which are um, how might you be able to apply uh, some of these estimates in your own work? And also what types of formats and deliverables would be most effective for you in your projects and jurisdictions that you work with? A bit of a roadmap ahead here, we're going to look at a brief introduction to small area estimates themselves, our study area, uh, two different primary models we'll be looking at include the random forest and SEDS based models. Uh, we'll do a brief comparison, uh, provide a couple different case studies, and finally provide a basis for future work moving forward. So as is, the state is already um, engaged with delivering statistics at many different scales. Uh, very regularly, this will end up being a combined statistical area, city, county, and various levels of census geography. However, when we end up receiving special requests from any number of um, different stakeholders and jurisdictions and districts, it's very rare that their boundaries will end up conforming to these known administrative boundaries. So what we really need is a way to be able to um, create much finer estimates of population and housing units uh, at a much finer scale, getting down into parcel or building footprint level. And so that's really kind of where these suites of methodologies uh, end up coming in. And so when we talk about small area estimates, there are two primary camps that we need to keep in mind. Uh, the first and foremost is bottom up, uh, in which you're utilizing data sources um, and other uh, statistical modeling in order to construct an estimate from the ground up and then comparing it against some known larger unit uh, and this is in hard contrast then to top-down based methodologies where you start with a much larger estimate and you distribute that according to some model or data to a finer level, only then to validate it against the finest known unit. And so as we're talking about the methodologies today, we're really only going to be focusing on this top-down based methodology because we are already engaged with delivering statistics at state, county, and city level um, throughout the state of California. And we wanna make sure that anything we deliver is going to continue to be consistent with the estimates that we already produce. So in general, as small areas are applied uh, through many different states and jurisdictions, uh, people tend to fall back on using the housing unit method. And I'm sure this is something that's already been covered uh, to death for many of you, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Uh, but I do wanna highlight kind of two major reasons why we're not really applying it in this specific circumstance. Uh, the first and foremost is that it requires consistent uh, geographic and uh, metadata related coverage through the entire state. Uh, as is, we end up accumulating our data sources for things like housing units uh, from a wide variety of different sources. And so we really have to make sure that any model we apply can uh, use the full extent of detail available where we have an abundance, but is also robust enough to be able to fill in some of these gaps where maybe we don't have enough information. 
Similarly, a uh, person's per household ends up being another area of concern, specifically when it comes to the modifiable aerial unit problem, which is the idea that anytime you have a statistic at any specific scale, the moment you start to increase or decrease that scale, um, you will end up producing a completely different meaning. And so in particular, when we're talking about trying to distribute any measure of persons per household, even from the city scale down to finer levels of geometry, we end up losing a lot of uh, really important differentiation between how different communities end up organizing themselves in terms of density. Uh, so we really need a model that's going to be a little bit more robust than that for, us, for our purposes. And that's what really brings us into the two models that we're gonna discuss today. And that is the random forest and said space methodologies. So the study area that we're gonna end up looking at uh, as I'm throwing a few different examples uh, as we go along uh, include San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Orange and Riverside counties. Now I've selected each one of these counties because of their variant structural density, different coverages of some of these different covariates uh, that we'll be looking at and also because they each have been the subject of relatively recent requests um, that we'll then be able to pull from when we're doing case studies. So the first model that we'll end up looking at here is the random forest. And I wanted to kind of start with at a broadest level to kind of give people an idea and a foundation for what exactly we're talking about. Uh, random forest is a form of supervised machine learning, meaning that it's a model that accepts input and output pairs in order to inform some estimation of a result. Um, it's also classified as a form of ensemble machine learning, uh, meaning that instead of utilizing a singular algorithm, it uses a multitude of them. In particular, in this case, we're talking about a bundle of regression trees, which in great quantity, a lot of trees make up a forest. Um, it's different uh, from singular regression or decision-based learning trees in that it utilizes uh, an emphasis on randomness uh, that we would call feature bagging in this case. Uh, this is where you take a random subset uh, sampling with replacement of your training data in order to feed into each tree. Uh, it's run independently any number of times and ends up improving on bagging via a random selection of predictors on each node. So there's a lot of different elements that different ways that you're able to incorporate randomness uh, along to along the process of this forest. The end result is then back transformed over the mean of all random forest trees and can then be applied in prediction to any area that those same covariates might exist. And so this is a really awesome technique because uh, it prevents overfitting to your training data with the introduction of randomness um, and also makes it very easy to glean feature importance when we're trying to take a look at how some of these different covariates then relate to the variable that we try to predict. So our own specific random forest model is a little bit different than what you might get straight out of the box. Um, in particular, our response variable we end up looking at is 2010 census block logarithmic density, anywhere that it is greater than zero. Uh, our explanatory covariates as seen in this table here can be broadly categorized into three major groupings. They include categorical inputs, which are primary land cover types, uh, continuous raster inputs, such as nighttime lights and environmental information, and also converted vector inputs, such as building footprints, residential area, and broadband information. Now, each one of these inputs has to be uh, normalized and formatted in such a way that it can be fed and read into the model uh, correctly. And so we end up utilizing a variety of different approaches in and of themselves just to coerce all this information into a useful format. So there's lots of bilinear resampling, uh, inverse Euclidean distancing, just to get everything about exactly where we need to be. The forest itself consists of 500 individual regression trees, uh, where the number of terminal node observations are equal to one or the number of administrative units divided by 1,000. Uh, and we end up excluding 10% of all training data for validation at the end of the day. One of these things that we get out of a model like this uh, is a measure of variable importance, which for our purposes here, we can think of as the percent sum of Gini coefficients uh, across the duration um, of the models. Uh, in particular, I've highlighted here the six sort of major covariates that end up relating to our response variable of population density. Uh, and they include things that we would already kind of infer at a glance. Um, and these are things like built distance, building footprints, nighttime lights, residential areas, and also major intersections. Now, what's not pictured here are the plethora of other attributes and covariates that we've included that did not respond very highly to our response variable. And the beauty of using a methodology like this is that we can automatically kick and exclude specific covariates that um, don't, don't work well within the model. Um, so this ends up being situations where there is no variance across the entire area that you try to predict, 
uh, as well as situations where there is no meaningful improvement in error uh, within the covariate throughout the duration of the, the trees in the forest. So all that, what does it mean? What do you get at the end of the day? You get something like you see here. Uh, this is a 30 meter persons per pixel raster. Uh, it takes between seven and 24 hours to complete, depending on the size and the complexity of the area that you're looking at. And it can be parameterized uh, to output just about any type of uh, table and diagnostic that you want. Uh, I've inserted a very really simplified one here in the corner. Uh, we can see that we're consistently producing a training R squared above about that 0.95 uh, validation also above 0.85, and finally, invariance explained around 85%. Uh, the really awesome thing about being able to use a method like this uh, is that you can also parameterize locations on non-target areas. Um, so if you have run a model for LA or Orange County even, and you recognize that it's just not performing very well, then you can still parameterize a model based on surrounding areas that maybe have a little bit more of a heterogeneous distribution of the various covariates. Um, in order to then apply that in prediction to a separate area. So there's a lot of leeway in terms of how you can parameterize these models in order to produce an optimal output. The random forest, of course, is not perfect, and we need to be transparent about this. Uh, first and foremost, it's a form of interpolation and not extrapolation, meaning that the range of values that you input into the model is the same range of values that you'll get on the output. Um, it has a tendency overall to under or sorry, overestimate in rural areas. As you can see in the inset map here, uh, each one of these little blue pixels has received 0 0.004 uh, persons, which when aggregated across a mountain range or desert uh, will lead to an erroneous prediction for rural areas. And then in hard contrast, we have a tendency to underestimate in urban areas. And this is largely the product of multifamily and group quarters-based living situations, um, which are poorly represented by spectral characteristics alone. So while this is a really awesome methodology for us to understand population distribution um, at a relatively coarse scale, we really require the implementation of some other additional inputs um, in order to make this more usable at a very, very fine scale. And so that brings us to the SEDS, or Cadastral Expert Diasymmetric System. Uh, we love SEDS, though, because that's much shorter. Uh, as it was originally posed by Georgiana Strode and Juliana Mente, it was a top-down based population distribution model in which you would start with some larger unit and distribute it according to residential area and residential units uh, held in separate at parcel level. You would then compare those two different parcel level estimates against some finest known unit uh, in order to determine which had the minimal difference. So you would select a different methodology for each one of these parcels. You would then end up uh, aggregating that to the block group level and selecting the methodology that was used the most frequently or in order to then apply it to the entire block group as a whole. Um, so the beauty of something like this is that you can create uh, what is effectively a patchwork of different distributional methods based on what has produced the minimal difference um, throughout your area that you're trying to estimate. So we're not necessarily using this straight out of the box as is. We introduce a couple of our own variants to it uh, as we get going here. Uh, first and foremost, we use a multitude of different SEDS-based candidates. So while we are still using residential area and residential units as inputs into our model, uh, we're accepting them from many different sources because we have uh, a couple different data partners and collaborators that we're able to pull information from. We're also incorporating at this scale uh, things like building footprint area, the number of bedrooms for each individual parcel, as well as the random forest density service that we just finished discussing earlier. Uh, we are also incorporating a level of uh, group quarters distribution. This inspired by another paper by Georgiana Strode. Uh, in particular, we are already engaged with keeping track of some of our largest group quarters throughout the state. Uh, and those include things like uh, military areas, as well as uh, dorms um, and other correctional facilities as well. So we're able to distribute those populations with a very, very high level of accuracy to very specific buildings and locations throughout the state. Uh, additionally, we're incorporating a level of building footprint control. And this is uh, primarily used as a binary disymmetric mask. Uh, for our purposes here, we are already producing this estimate at parcel scale. Yet when we bring in separate boundaries that we're pulling from uh, whatever partner that we end up working with, it's very rare that their boundaries will truly conform uh, with our parcel geometry. So we really need a way to be able to even go a little bit further. So just by being able to apply a building footprint mask, we're able to really refine exactly where population is located once we start looking at these weird geometries. 
And finally, we end up implementing a level of mixed vacancy control. And this is happening in two primary ways here, both from a bottom up perspective, where we're taking data at the address or parcel level to identify areas of vacancy, as well as a top down control, just to make sure that any vacancy we're producing is consistent with the vacancy rates that we predict at larger scales. Now, one of the big operative assumptions that we get into when we're talking about a SEDS or like top-down based methodology is that of congruent geometry. And that's really just the assumption that your highest levels of geometry are going to be able to distribute population then into their parcel network and then from there into their building footprints and everything's gonna be dandy. Think of it as a great, great big old Russian doll. Um, the unfortunate reality is uh, that that's never the case. Um, all of these boundaries that are intersecting, crisscrossing every which way, and it requires a lot of data cleaning in order to really coerce these assumptions to be true. And so a little bit of an example of what we might look at uh, is something like you can see here on the screen. Our building footprint data set is highlighted in blue, and we're using a remotely sensed data set provided by uh, Microsoft for the 2020 vintage. Because it's remotely sensed, it doesn't always uh, produce entirely accurate polygons. Um, and so areas that maybe share walls or are very, very close together in dense urban settings aren't always split apart into multiple features. So we can take it with a building footprint that intersects many different parcels. We can intersect it or union it in order to uh, create many different slivers, and then finally dissolve those back according to an area threshold to their nearest neighbor. So we can create what is effectively an artificial parcel and building footprint network that does fit this assumption of congruent geometry. So I really want to stress that we're not necessarily using uh, just straight out of the box parcel networks like we, uh, we might expect. Now I want to spend a little bit of time discussing a couple of different improvements that we've seen uh, in the past few years. Um, we've had this program going for a little while, so it's constantly updating uh, as we get access to new data. One of these biggest improvements that we've seen uh, is at our parcel level. When we originally started, uh, we were using primarily open source data, uh, which we were pulling from the LA County data portal. It had vintages between 2014 and 2015, was relatively inconsistent uh, because there was no uh, real correction occurring between the different counties. So there were plenty of differences in terms of projection, as well as just overlap between their geometries. There were also many areas of data gaps. Um, so in this particular area, you can see above, we had a large hole surrounding uh, San Luis Obispo, which for our purposes, we needed to backfill with something. And so what we ended up doing was using uh, Thessian polygons based on address points uh, for the entire area, just to create something artificial that we could run with. Um, but this isn't ideal. <laughs> and then finally, that this is really just a geometric data set. This has no meaningful attribution associated with it. So we had to connect them with external data sets in order to uh, glean further meaning into what's happening with each one of these parcels. This is then in hard contrast to where we're at now. Uh, this, within the past few months here, we've adopted a parcel quest for the 2021 vintage. Uh, it's consistent across the entire state, has no overlap, everything connects, just perfect and dandy, um, has no data gaps, so we're not having to do any weird polygons like you see up above, uh, and it has abundant attribution that goes with it, uh, so we're no longer having to rely so much on creating uh, all kinds of different spatial relationships in order to glean meaning uh, from these individual parcels. Another one of these improvements is residential definitions. Uh, because we were using uh, sort of this void of polygons when it came to the parcels, we were primarily getting information from Pitney Bowes, um, which I believe is now called Precisely. Uh, this is an address point based data set. Um, it has a couple issues when it comes to location. As you can see up above, there's a little bit of noise that gets introduced. Uh, the locations are sometimes placed on top of buildings, sometimes driveways, sometimes road carriageways. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty that ends up getting involved, and it has a lot of duplicates that end up coming with it as well. Sometimes multifamily structures are hundreds of points stacked on top of one another, and other times it's represented by a single point with archaic attribution in some table somewhere to tell you what's happening. Um, that in hard contrast to Parcel Quest, again, very clear attribution. We know exactly what's residential and what's not. Uh, we can easily backfill in some cases with the Pitney Bowes data. Um, in certain instances, we can still find multifamily units that have received attribution for an assumption of greater than or equal to five units. Um, and it makes it much easier for us to then just reference back to a separate data set to pull in some of that information. And finally, we also have uh, advanced utility information, which is really useful to exclude road carriageways, parking lots, and other non-target features that we just don't want to muddle down these models to begin with. 
So I don't want to paint uh, everything as absolutely perfect uh, within this world of us using ParcelQuest as a data set. Um, ultimately, it's like any other data set in that it is accepting and curating uh, data from the county level. And so it's always going to be vulnerable to whatever the county is able to provide. In this particular instance, in Orange County, uh, we have a high level of variance within singular APNs. So in this one area, there's uh, a shared APN between all of these little polygons you can see. And residential area has been defined for the road carriageway and the paths surrounding the locations. So we have a mix of use codes happening within the same APN. Um, and they are inaccurately recorded in the database that's delivered to us. With a little bit of handy automation, backfilling with pitney bows and known building footprint polygons, we can then identify four areas um, where we have these mixed use types in order to correct on the fly. So we can start with something like this and end up with something like this that's being fed into our model instead. Um, so we have a, a high level of automation that we're able to include just in, by way of data cleaning and methods like this. Uh, similarly, as we were talking about multifamily structures where greater than five units are known, um, we end up having to reference back to that uh, Pitney Bowes data set in order to glean information. However, a lot of times for multifamily structures, uh, they will list the units with a, an office or like a community center or something like that, as opposed to being fully distributed uh, throughout uh, the housing complex. And so in this particular instance, we've been able to glean a number of units that's applied to these uh, two portions of the shared APN using the methods we've discussed previously based on shared APN uh, use or borders, as well as building footprints, we're able to redistribute that population dynamically to the areas where we know that it ought to occur. Um, so we're, we are able to, uh, in a pretty robust way, backfill uh, information for areas of gap. I also don't wanna paint this as absolutely perfect because there are still about 5% of all multifamily settings that have no meaningful attribution coming from ParcelQuest that also have no meaningful information coming from Pitney Bowes. So we still have some areas of data gap that are occurring. Another key improvement here is the uh, identification of new structures. One of those assumptions of top-down based methodologies is that your greater or higher level unit uh, will always encompass an accurate number, but that's not always the case. Uh, in this particular instance, you can see the area in the upper image highlighted in blue represents a block group that was recorded as having greater than zero housing units. We've successfully distributed population down to each one of those parcels. However, just on the other side of that orange line, we have a block group with a recorded zero housing units, um, which is a problem for us. So we're able to incorporate into this model the identification of areas that are otherwise excluded, known to be residential, and can use a nearest neighbor based algorithm um, along with a couple other criteria in order to identify what types of distribution methods would be most useful to backfill those locations. So regardless of whether or not it's recorded in the census data that we end up comparing with, we're still able to include and capture all residential areas uh, that are effective during the time of uh, estimation. So jumping over into the comparison of these models, we're gonna be looking at four different uh, primary iterations here. Uh, and each one will then be compared against 2010 census data in turn. So we are trying to model for an older vintage in this particular case. Uh, the 2019 SEDS based model is using that slightly outdated partial data and residential definition and has a limited number of covariates fed into it, which then in contrast to our 2021 iteration, uh, which then utilizes parcel quest for both the parcel geometry and residential definition, as well as many new covariates being implemented, uh, primarily the random forest and bedroom spaced information. Similarly, the random forest is then put up for comparison just to see how it's actually performing and doing. Uh, the non-adjusted format is a simple binary disymmetric mask just of the uh, residential parcels. And then the adjusted version is those same residential parcels adjusted by some top-down control. Taking a look at the SEDS-based distribution of what actually gets used in terms of our distribution-based methodologies, uh, we can see that in 2019, we're relying very heavily on residential units as highlighted in blue. Yet, as we move to 2021, we can see that we're using units a lot less frequently. Uh, in particular here, we can, um, we can assume that this is occurring primarily of the disparity between multifamily and single family based distributions. Uh, because if we're using a unit based distribution and we're looking at a large subdivision where everything's classified as one, we know that every single housing unit in those areas will logically receive the same amount of population or the same proportion. Uh, in contrast, when we then inform that model with something like bedrooms or the random forest model, we suddenly have a much more robust surface 
um, being able to tell us a, of even more fine levels of variation that might occur within that same uh, suburban based environment. Um, so we also have to acknowledge too that residential units does not completely phase out of the equation here for 2021 and that it's still being caught up a decent amount of the time where we're talking about densely populated urban areas uh, as well as multifamily living situations. Checking out a scatter plot of our 2010 model uh, compared against census block population, uh, we can refine this a little bit further into just our best fit lines for the four models. In red, we have the non-adjusted random forest with an R squared of 0.42. Uh, so it's just not even close, not even worth using. But simply by applying a top-down level of control, we're able to increase that R squared to 0.71. Uh, so there is still a decent, a decent quality to the data sets we're producing there. Uh, similarly, for the 2019 seds based model, we produce an R squared of 0.85, which then increases to 0.9 with the introduction of that revised uh, residential definition, as well as the implementation of the random forest as a potential uh, distributive covariate. We see the same path, uh, pattern emerging when we look at the mean absolute percent error. Uh, again, we're seeing the largest levels of error coming from the random forest itself, uh, largely resulting from that difference in residential definition. Um, and we then see it then improving between 2019 and 2021 iterations of SEDS as we begin to refine our process and incorporate more data inputs. Now for our 2021 model, um, when we look at a histogram of where exactly our errors are distributed, um, I'm, I'm comforted to see that everything falls within that 0 to uh, 11 uh, bin here. But what I'm really curious about is what happens at these outliers for some of these areas of egregious estimation. And I was able to identify three different um, reasons why we might have some of these larger errors uh, that occur with relative frequency. And the first one was misplaced Pitney Bowes points. So in this particular instance, the census returned for this rural parcel that there were six individuals found there. We ended up estimating 294, the result of many different points being stacked one on top of another with an erroneous geolocation uh, and slight variations in their addresses and coding uh, so that they could not be caught by a duplicate filter. Um, so this is a problem with our input data. Uh, similarly, areas of misallocated census units uh, seem to contribute a decent amount to this error. Uh, for the census, it returned about one individuals for this multifamily complex, while we returned 410. Uh, the remaining of that population for 2010 was returned to the road carriageway surrounding it. Uh, so this is an area where we are actually a little bit more comfortable with our estimate uh, when compared to the census. And then finally, instances of new construction. Because ultimately we're relying on data from the county level, uh, we really uh, end up banking on them providing us with good attribution and helpful metadata. So in this particular instance, uh, the 2010 census recorded seven individuals while we returned over 2000. Uh, this is the result of a new subdivision that had no uh, meaningful uh, permit or effective date information. So it's just left, left, left inserted into an older vintage model. So I'm gonna jump into a couple different case studies to give you an idea of what this actually looks like as it's being applied. We're gonna start with some really small fine tuned examples and we're gonna work our way up into some much bigger examples of how this is currently being applied. In this specific example, we're gonna look at the Martinez fire, uh, which happened on the, Mar the Martinez Torres Reservation in Riverside County in 2018. Uh, Cal Fire reported that seven uh, residential units were destroyed. Just based on the intersection of 2010 census blocks, we can predict that there are somewhere around, you know, 86 residential units within the area that could have potentially been impacted. Based on our most recent uh, 2021 uh, SEDS based methodology, uh, we were able to identify at first an estimate of absolutely zero population, uh, that because of the uh, parcel being coded as agricultural use. Uh, with further collaboration at the county scale uh, with the uh, assessor, we were able to identify subuse 58, which otherwise was not included in our own data, which denotes a residential subuse type. With that further adaptation, we could revise the estimate to around 32.7, which when we apply a binary disymmetric building footprint mask, uh, we could further refine to 7.15, getting dangerously close to what we already know uh, was reported. In another example here, we can look at Orcutt Library District. In 2019, I delivered an estimate to them uh, of around like 30,000 individuals. And I very promptly received a call from one of the constituents saying, hey, this looks a little bit low. 
I think you might be missing some population because I drive by this uh, new uh, apartment complex every single day, and I'm not sure if it's being included. And sure enough, going back, looking at the data, as you can see in this inset map here, there was this entire subdivision of new construction that was otherwise not being captured by the model. This being the result of uh, erroneous geolocation of residential points from that Pitney Bowes data set. Now with the implementation and improvements to the 2021 iteration, we were able to fully capture all areas of, of residential use and distribute population proportionally to those areas. So we ended up revising the estimate to gain around 1,000 individuals uh, to meet that new estimate. In another example, uh, it was requested that we uh, produce an estimate by zip code uh, for the city of Irvine. Uh, we ended up opting to use Zictas instead because zip codes tend to represent um, linear features and they're not so good when it comes to specific geographic boundaries. Uh, and because of time constraints, we ended up utilizing uh, the ACS estimate uh, for that time period, which for all of the intersecting Zictas was around 277,000 individuals. Now, as you can see at this inset map here, the Zicta boundaries highlighted in teal uh, don't totally match up with the city boundary for uh, the city of Irvine. And so we really need a way to be able to take this estimate that we have at Zicta scale and further refine it and sort of chop some of the edges off of some of these other Zicta based estimates. Now, with the implementation of the small area estimates procedure, uh, we are able to identify and reduce that estimate to around 273,000, seeing a decrease of around 3,000 individuals. We're also able to distribute population to very precise key locations throughout the city, uh, including Concordia University and UC Irvine, as highlighted here in the consent map. What's more, with the implementation of ParcelQuest, we do have address-based information for absolutely everything. So we can deliver by a zip code if we really want to. Uh, but as you can see in these maps uh, highlighted here, they are um, not very contiguous. And I think they would be very difficult to read for our user at the end. Looking at a much larger example, each year we end up being engaged with delivering estimates uh, for different library districts throughout the entire state. Uh, in particular, Santa Barbara stands out to me uh, because the estimates um, for the four different library zones encompass the entire county. Uh, in this particular instance, we needed to take our E5 January 1st, 2021 estimate and distribute that, that down into these four major zones. Um, so with the implementation of our SEDS-based methodology, uh, we are able to fully identify specific residential parcels and distribute population at a very, very fine scale in order to produce those estimates for those four regions. Now, what inevitably comes around when we produce an estimate of this magnitude are more questions about, hey, what exactly happened in my town or what happened in my jurisdiction? And the beauty of using a method like this is that once it's been run and once it's been produced, we can automatically apply any number of other geographic scales to this same existing estimate. So when we return um, with a series of new requests uh, from different bodies uh, throughout the county, we can then point very specifically and very quickly uh, to some of these new jurisdictions. So in this particular instance, we ended up returning an additional 52 um, areas that were otherwise unrelated to the original estimate query. So in conclusion, just some of the takeaways I want you all to be able to keep in mind uh, is that the random forest was ultimately comparable uh, to SEDS uh, when it is masked um, and also adjusted, but ultimately uh, that the best estimates end up combining both the SEDS and random forest based methodologies. Um, and also finally, that we can always improve with county specific information. So thinking back to that Martinez fire example, even just by being able to communicate with the county assessor, uh, we were able to improve the quality of our estimate uh, based on very, very specific information at the county level. So where do we go from here is kind of the big question. And probably the thing that I'm the most excited for uh, is the release of a web mapping application. And we're doing this in partnership with the US National Grid Institute uh, to utilize their gridded mapping solution, uh, which provides a consistent or spatially consistent uh, spatial grid uh, for you, us to be able to apply our estimates to. And so this is available from 100 kilometers uh, all the way down to 100 meter scale. Uh, and at every single level, you are able to select any number of grids in order to receive an estimate on the fly of each one of these locations. Now, uh, we're using this for a multitude of reasons because it is uh, very helpful in terms of data privacy for our data partners. Uh, so these are things um, like we just don't want to be able to distribute all of our parcel information, et cetera, et cetera, that we pay large sums of money for. Uh, but it also protects the privacy of the individuals uh, that we are trying to estimate population for. 
Um, and it also allows us for a, a lot easier processing on the back end, so we're not trying to host uh, the millions of building footprints throughout the entire state. Now, one of the neat things that ends up coming with a web mapping application like this uh, is, of course, the inset tools that we can get to go with it. And so you can select any number of these grid cells, draw your own polygons, or upload your own boundaries even, in order to receive estimates on the fly. Um, this is a really awesome methodology because very frequently we'll receive requests uh, that are like, hey, I need an estimate by tomorrow. And more often than not, we are just not well equipped to be able to give that fast of a turnaround on something very uh, highly customized. Um, but so this provides something that at a glance on demand, you can get an estimate for whatever you're working on. I do want to stress that this does not end up replacing our long form small area estimates procedure, uh, if only because estimates that are already produced at building footprint or parcel scale are already going to be more accurate when applied to your areas, um, as well as because any additional information we can glean from the stakeholder, uh, as well as from the county assessor will only serve to bolster and improve the performance of these models. So my recommendation is always to contact us if you have the time a month in advance and we'll make sure we can produce something like top notch for you. Uh, but otherwise, these are tools uh, that will be available to you. Uh, so this is currently drafted in my own notebook as I'm hoping to have it live by the end of July, early August. Um, this will be uh, continuing to be updated as, as I'm producing more and more of these maps and producing more and more estimates. Uh, so it's going to be a continuing work in progress. Um, other projects we're really looking forward to being able to use this technology in uh, include CQR. In particular, we're already accustomed to identifying areas of weird census geography that don't match up very well to known residential boundaries and our own estimates. Uh, so these are this is already just a direct byproduct that we can pull from um, for this other initiative. And then finally, also the California Neighborhoods Count Survey, which is wrapping up right now, which will allow us to decrease our reliance on a lot of um, our census-based products, which is especially helpful when we're looking um, at differential privacy moving forward, um, and will also allow us for a much more solid uh, baseline once we start comparing to actual ground truthing of some of these estimates, which I'm very, very eager for. <laughs> so with that, I want to thank you all uh, for coming to this presentation. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor to specific questions. Uh, we also have a couple different discussion prompts that we can use uh, if they're useful to us. Uh, as always, my contact information is above, and so if you don't feel like talking or typing in the chat box, uh, please feel free to reach out, and I am happy to answer all the questions in the world. Thanks so much, everyone. I actually have a question, if I may ask. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, besides the population density, what else have you used these methods for? Besides population density, well, I mean, realistically, that's, that's meeting yeah. finding population. Mm -hmm. So it, right now, it's really just its population and its housing units that we're using currently. Right. Okay. Uh, and so the majority of this ends up being informed by uh, the work done by WorldPop, uh, if you're familiar with that group, um, which does primarily random forest-based modeling techniques um, to predict population at a worldwide scale. Uh, the you know, the downside for them is ultimately they have to use a high level of standardization and normalization uh, when it comes to their estimates, but they do provide an absolutely wonderful basis to be able to incorporate more refined information where we have areas like in California. We got all the data in the world. Uh, why not use it? <laughs> mm -hmm. And what uh, do you do? What software do you do all your analysis in or what? <laughs> suite of software, I should say. It's it's mix and match right now, for sure. Um, I use a mix of R and then Python, Esri, and also FME. Um, this this is all stuff that's constantly changing as I find better ways and more time efficient uh, ways to do things. So Thank you. So I have, I have a question. Yeah. I'm thinking about some of the variation related to future development and how some is subdivisions and some is like high density developments in San Francisco and environs. Like what sort of data requirements would you need going forward to estimate a new, say, relatively high density neighborhood? Um, do you need, what was it, Pitkin Bowls? What was it called? To be oh, up to date for that estimate to work out or what needs to be ready on third party data for you to be able to estimate a new high density subdivision, if you will. 
Right, right. So for us, the, the big key for us moving forward um, has less to do actually with, I think, our uh, privatized data partners and more to do with the ongoing partnerships and discussions with uh, HCD, uh, mm -hmm. in particular with some of their forthcoming dashboard products and things, uh, ends up looking like we'll end up being able to uh, pull information at a very fine uh, level when it comes to specific permitting. Uh, because as is, we end up collecting survey results for specific permitting at city and county scale. Mm -hmm. um, however, we don't always have the right spatial information to tell us exactly where new uh, new structures uh, are being built. But mm -hmm. with any luck, uh, that information being provided from HCD will help us uh, to be able to produce these estimates at a very, very fine level moving forward, because that ends up including all the important information about um, exactly where, how many units, uh, expected uh, completion date, effective use, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, I, I always want to encourage to um, sometimes people underestimate uh, the value of their own data products that they have in house. Uh, so sometimes when we receive requests from other specific districts, even being able to incorporate stuff like uh, electric use, water usage, uh, other information that you might not think uh, might correlate with population density can still help us immensely when we're training some of these models and figuring out how we want things to connect. So. Are the My, models trained on, trained on county specific data then? Is there a separate one for each county? Yeah, so the way it's set up right now is that I am using county specific based information. Um, but when it comes to things like the web mapping uh, application, we're relying on a very standardized and normalized take on that, uh, just to be able to produce with some level of consistency between the different areas. Um, but yeah, ultimately the best results are found on a county by county basis because everyone is different in terms of the data they're able to incorporate, for sure. There's a question on the chat from Tina. Did you see that, Finis? So uh, she asks, are there counties that aren't covered? Counties that aren't covered? Um, Realistically, no. I mean, in, in terms of the, uh, the data set that I've been pointing at for doing like the, the web mapping based application, I'm currently, I think at like eight counties, we're still kind of like in the early stages of making sure everything's there. Uh, I want to make sure everything's working before I just um, push the mass of all the maps out. <laughs> um, but otherwise, yeah, we do have the data and we do have the support to be able to estimate for every single county. So. Yes, please. <laughs> we're, we're always happy to receive any help we can get uh, and any additional data, data sets you might have uh, that, that pop up in your mind. Um, I can pretty much guarantee you we can use them. We can find a use for them. <laughs> uh, are there any other specific questions regarding to the presentation? Hi, this is Tina live. So um, I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. So I will probably reach out to you and so we can chat about all kinds of details that people um, probably don't want to hear about at this stage. Um, but yeah, this is this is really great. I'm, I'm excited about this product and the potential for it. So thanks. Yeah. No All right, I see another question in the chat box here, uh, which says, will you be able to add sex, age, and race ethnicity details to the population estimates? Uh, currently at this time, that's not something that we're adding to the estimates themselves, um, but it has been used in the past um, by other demographers in order to get a sense for the weighting of specific demographic populations. Um, I also want to stress that the, the random forest-based technology is extremely underused, in my opinion. Uh, we're using it here to estimate population density, but it doesn't have to just be used for uh, some of these very uh, spatially consistent features across uh, space and time. So we could reasonably you know, parameterize models based on whatever demographic information we might think feeds into uh, specific demographic makeups. Um, so. There's, there's definitely, there's more that can be explored there for sure. <laughs> I 
yes, please do, please do. <laughs> I'd be interested in hearing of any anybody who's here in the um, in the uh, in this Zoom how they use small area population products, and if anybody uses it and might be different or similar to to um, the models, the estimation methods that you've shown today. So this is Tina Glover, and I'm with SACOG. Um, we have a parcel level database that um, that we maintain, but it's we, we get the, our parcel data from each of our six counties, and they then we do various things with it. Um, you know, and, and as you've probably already noticed, <laughs> Fennis and others, every county does it a little bit different. So mm -hmm. um, trying to normalize something can be a real challenge. Um, in the meantime, we also collect uh, building permits from all of our jurisdictions, our cities and counties. And um, we, uh, we put them through a process basically to identify the building permit at the address point, put it on the correct parcel, make sure there's not duplicates. You know, we, we do a lot of screening. We've been doing that since um, the early 2000s. So we've really refined the process, I wanna say in the last probably 10 years. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely talk more about that, Fennis, for sure. Um, oh, yeah. But when it, yeah. I've yeah, yeah. Love that. that. I've already kind of have a, a little bit of an infrastructure to do that on our end. Oh, cool. uh, but I'm sure it's not as beautiful and polished as what y'all have going on. <laughs> love to talk. <laughs> great, great. Um, as far as population estimates go, I mean, it, it, small area stuff is, is, of course, always tricky. And we usually, um, or I create some different population estimates, not at the parcel level, but I do mine at the block level. Um, the census block level, at least at this point using 2010 census blocks. And it's just something to kind of keep track of stuff, but it gets, we don't have a really fine uh, system for tracking vacancy rates. That's like a huge piece of it, especially as they vary so widely. And in our region, they've gotten tighter and tighter. So um, there, there, there are some other things that we can talk about with that, but um, there is a, for, for our projection purposes, because we do long range planning as well, um, we do have parcel based uh, forecasts for population and housing and jobs. And um, our modeling team could also talk to you about that. Um, I know the big four around the state, there are many conversations that happen regularly amongst them all and, and some of the smaller cogs also weigh in on that. Um, so We'll connect later, but there's there there are there are already some groups that um, are working on these kinds of things that I think will, might be really useful um, as far as your process going forward. So I'll stop talking now, <laughs> but I look forward to chatting more. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Cool. Sungbin had a question in the chat. Any of you saw that? There's uh, yeah. about there's a. All right. So it says, uh, if one has growth control and development uh, projects list, do you think it's possible to apply in forecast? Um, so right now, hmm, I got to think on that. Because I, I don't see why not. I think it depends on the granularity of the information that you're talking about. When you're talking about a development pro uh, projects list, do you mean having uh, some sort of a specific indicator for, all right, here are all the new permits or buildings that should be going live in the next uh, next few years? Or Because realistically, what we could, okay, here we go. Uh, you say nowadays, uh, MPOs are operating uh, ABM models that require synthetic population individual households and uh, member residential pop data is available. Uh, now the question is to find the location or parcel for each synthetic household population. I see, I see. Yeah, that is, that is an ongoing question of mine as well. Uh, in particular, when it comes to trying to figure out what to do with extraneous levels of population. Because when I first started doing this, I did uh, start using the housing unit model um, where I was just saying, all right, you know, let's assume that persons per household is consistent across all our cases. Uh, but in some cases, we would end up estimating a population growth um, that did not seem to be correlated very well with the parcel-based information that we had about new construction. And so the, the blanket assumption ended up being that, all right, well, there's an increase in density 
of population that's occurring within the known units. But it does always bother me, <laughs> um, to say the least, uh, that one would logically assume that, hey, there's going to be very specific isolated areas of growth, uh, but we don't necessarily have the indicators to tell us exactly spatially where that growth ends up occurring. And I think that's what's really valuable about having uh, up-to-date permitting data at the parcel level in order to determine exactly where these new construction areas are, are being output. And just to even be able to see, hey, does that match uh, the overall growth in population that we tend to observe uh, in any meaningful way? Just cross-section. Uh, yes, I completely agree. That would be a very worthwhile comparison. Um, if you could, or are you comfortable um, sending me more information to the, uh, the email address that's posted up on the screen? Because I would love to talk with you further about this. Uh, thinking back on, I know, Tina, you mentioned briefly a bit of confusion and concern around um, vacancy rates. And I, I wanted to corroborate that uh, I, I share a lot of those same concerns. Uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, we're using sort of this mixed method approach. But as, as I'm sure you realized, when, we, uh, when we're controlling vacancy only at the parcel level, um, it's rare that that ends up matching in any meaningful way with what we're producing at a higher level. Uh, so we really just end up having to choose, all right, what are we gonna go with? And more often than not, we use our, our higher level estimates, so. Right, and there, there are benefits and drawbacks to that, um, especially you know, given what kind of area you're looking at. If um, you're, you're looking at an urban core, chances are your household sizes are gonna be much smaller. Your vacancy yeah. rates might be wider, they might be tighter. You know, it just really depends on so many different factors. So I agree. So I know we, we got a little bit of time left here. Um, so I would like to pose uh, to the group a couple of different questions too. Uh, more so aligned with your own work and your own areas of expertise. Um, but what I'm really curious about is what types of products and what types of derivatives of this type of information would be most valuable to you guys as data users? Um, because it's easy for us up in like the, the ivory tower of finance not to realize exactly what's going to be the most applicable and useful uh, to everyone else. Since nobody say anything, this is Tina, I'll just put, put some more stuff out there. Um, yeah. With the fears around differential privacy in the census, um, you know, I'm really glad that DOF is taking, or you guys are taking the lead on this and, and trying to come up with an alternative. Um, because, you know, generally I, I get a ton of data requests. Um, I run one of the regional state data centers and um, they primarily rely on different types of census data. Of course, at this point, ACS is, is sort of the, the lead um, data set, but the 2020 population and housing results and everything that comes out of the 2020 census in the next, you know, in a couple of months here, we're very excited about that. Um, I think that, uh, sorry, I have too many thoughts going in my head at one time. So I think for population housing estimates, that'll be hugely useful for special districts in particular, because I, I do a lot of work with um, some of our local library districts, some of our water districts, some of our you know fire districts, you name it, we've got special districts all over. And, and of course their boundaries hardly ever line up with any kind of census boundary. And then you've got these limitations on um, you know how, how dated is the data, um, even in terms of population and housing. I've worked with um, Sacramento County Sheriff and Sac City PD and um, you know, they've been frustrated that we don't have sort of a, a better annual population estimate for different neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. And we've explained the limitations of the models that we use to, to estimate population at those smaller areas. 
Um, and they just get frustrated. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that if we could, you know, do a better job on that, I think it would be super useful for all kinds of different um, groups. And, you know, I mean, we're talking about fire evacuation and um, gosh, just, you know, that kind of an endless number of, of possibilities there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, kind of exactly what you're saying too. We, we have a, a wide variety of requests that we end up receiving and more often than not, they are exactly the same types of things it sounds like you're dealing with. Of, there are always fire districts, it's water districts, it's libraries, um, things that, that we're rarely match, yeah. This is uh, Mike Riley at MTC. Um, so I'm one, one of the big four also. Um, so it's a, it's a similar you know, approach of we, we build these large models at the parcel level and we're just getting ready to, to redo our 2020 parcel representation, which is, is, as you've pointed out in many ways, very painful and uses different data sources. They don't match up, et cetera. And, um, and so I think one, you know, one small thing is just, you know, while I realize you, you, you mentioned you purchased much of your data, um, but anything that's, um, that the state is collecting that's, that is not purchased, not proprietary. Like for instance, you mentioned um, group quarters. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time cobbling together a Bay Area list of group quarters and things like that. So even if, you know, some of your inputs that are maybe not even the most exciting ones that, uh, that would um, help us go into our mess of, of county parcel data, et cetera, just to kind of, um, um, you know, make sense or so we're not reinventing the wheel, et cetera. But uh, of course, beyond that, anything that, you know, is, is a, a consumer of data, just like you, anything, anything you can share is, is, is always amazing. But so far we, we, we would be moving again to the household based model. We want to simulate that, that same type of ABM, that micro simulation of a household with characteristics. And so, so it's a little bit different, but a lot of the inputs are the same. I think it's very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have, as you mentioned, that GQ Geo database that we were maintaining here um, is difficult to update in a lot of circumstances because for our major ones, yeah, we're we're all more than happy to do the legwork to make sure and keep tabs on exactly what's happening. But um, when it comes to some of these finer units, especially when it comes to things like group homes and things that are, are maybe more difficult for us to track, uh, it, it does definitely become a little bit of a guessing game in terms of what is still actually open because especially when it comes to some of these smaller nursing facilities, they just have such a high rate of turnover uh, that they can be there one moment and gone the next. Um, so I would definitely be interested in being able to share out some of our uh, GQ information to you, uh, hopefully to be able to support some of your work. And then maybe if you're able to corroborate the same information back to us. And, I was going to say, exactly. Piece we'll, together what's happening. Yeah, I'm, we'll I'm all sure. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I totally agree about GQ population. Um, and for us, the challenge is the population at the parcel level. We tend to avoid not much about we don't want to do it. It's it, population always at the parcel level always bring more complexity um, because we know by parcel, we know one household or by open space, we know it could have two or three household uh, housing units, but we really have no information to know uh, how many population would be 10. 20, um, and we, we don't know. So one thing, I'm glad that, you know, we can share the information and in we have the common challenges and you know, we can share work in the future. And another thing is, um, is the, we always encounter the parcel level uh, when you aggregate to block level or block group level, uh, it's inconsistent with the, what the census provided to us. But in the end, we have to follow the census because all the jurisdictions, they rely on more on the census rather than our own estimates. See, mm -hmm. if the city telling you they have 50,000 population at, by aggregating to all your parcel level to the city, you have to add up to that number. So yeah. that's at the small area, at the parcel level, we always encounter this kind of issues. And we spend the tons of the time to kind of struggle um, between the parcel estimates and the, the census block level data, and especially population. So yeah. that's, I'm glad uh, you know, we can share more work in the future and share more um, and uh, solutions, if any. Thank you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And as you come up with ideas or, or projects that you, you want collaboration on, this is, this is what I'm here for. <laughs> this, is, this is what I live for. So, yeah. You know, something that might be good that could come out of this is um, whatever COGS are interested, especially those working on their base years, because we're currently working on our 2020 base year as well. We finish mm -hmm. up our housing unit at parcel level update, and we're currently working on our employment, which is always, for those of you who know about it, it's kind of a nightmare, but you know, a lot of, a lot of cleaning of the data and whatnot, but um, come up with a pretty good product, so that's good. Um, but it would be great to talk about some of these issues and, and how we've dealt with them in the past, because um, SACOG's really used sort of the housing unit model and, and um, tried to estimate population based on a couple of different factors. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's always interesting to hear what others are doing and kind of the pros and cons that they've found about that. So maybe we can um, keep that in mind and, and have like a group call or something. Then I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know one of the things that's on my radar and, and I'm kind of, I'm holding out till I have kind of the, the web app fully functional and everything too, um, was the... Oh, what is it? Uh, California GIS Council uh, has a whole series of different working groups uh, for different modes of like data sharing and everything throughout the state. Um, but I don't believe there's currently a population specific uh, group there. Uh, but that is something that's definitely on my radar and I've been wanting to initiate. Maybe this is a good time to. <laughs> So there are a couple of comments in the chat. You want to look at that? Um, right. So Axel re recommend or uh, proposed uh, suggested that group quarters could be sourced from administrative records um, as as a way to to get started on yeah. estimating the group quarters. And um, so I've been asked if the training data is accessible. Your training data set. Uh, it is not currently accessible online, but if you reach out to me with the specific area that you're interested in, I'd be happy to share uh, all my covariates and everything out to you. Great. Yes, if there, if there are no other questions, um, I think we could, uh, yeah, unless you have, do you have any other comments or suggestions, Fennis, for? Um, not, not really. I mean, I, I feel like we've uh, we've done good here. We we forged some new relationships and potential data sharing opportunities, and uh, I look forward to uh, getting a couple emails here and continuing these discussions further. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just weigh in and say thanks, Fennis, and and then answer Axel's question since I kind of know about where that came from. Um, I don't think that there's too much of a problem with sharing our group quarters you know, sort of database, because yes, that was collected from a lot of, you know, administrative data that the state holds. Um, the only parts of it that are at all restrictive would be the ones about um, some group homes, certainly domestic violence shelters and various other things like that will not show up because those are clearly too sensitive to allow outside of, well, <laughs> the locked room that they're held in or the, the, the password protected areas. But short of that, um, I, most of that is, is, is ultimately publicly available data. It's just a question about, you know, you, you, you've got to convince other agencies to give it to you. So, um, which, which means we could redistribute it. Thank you, Walter. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so before we close off, I just wanted to remind everyone that day two of the workshop is next Tuesday. And, um, and so remember to, to uh, join us for that. We will continue this uh, conversation, the greater conversation. So there's, uh, let's see. Oh. So thank you guys very much. And we'll see you guys in a week. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Fennis. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.